In Genesis chapter 25 verse 23, it says, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Welcome to my series, A Journey to Faith. My name is Pastor Paul Brunton from the Jesus Movement, and this is Lesson 9, Esau sells his birthright, and Jacob receives his father's blessing. It's estimated that Rebecca gave birth to her two boys in 1835. The first she named Esau, which means hairy, because he was reddish in colour and he was hairy. The second, as God said, was born holding tightly onto the heel of the first, so she named him Jacob, which means he grasped the heel. As the boys grew up and matured, however, they were different from one another. Esau became a skillful hunter and a man of the open country. While Jacob was a quieter man and he would uh, stay among the tents. And we can read about this in Genesis chapter 25 verse 27. And Isaac, who loved to eat wild game, loved Esau more, whilst Rebekah loved Jacob more. On the pictures on this slide around uh, the side of me here, you can see a variety of pictures. Uh, beside me there's a representation of what it's believed that Esau would look like. You can see there uh, from the illustration that his arms are indeed hairy, he has a red coloured hair and he's got a quiver of bows on his back, uh, uh, beg your pardon, a quiver of arrows on his back and he's holding the uh, bow uh, with his hand whilst on the far side of the slide there's Jacob who's you know painted in a more pensive sort of position less strong in appearance um, and uh, standing amongst the tent so between the two of them I put a picture uh, of a tent which is basically a Bedouin tent as it's known today but these are the same tents as were produced in these times and they were made from uh, goats uh, here at the time and they have this uh, black color and often this uh, patterning. So this was home uh, for these people in those times and uh, when they were at home there was basically the function of, uh, of cooking and uh, taking care uh, of the children and all of their needs. So uh, Jacob had decided that this was more the life for him so he remained around the, the tents so which means he would have spent a lot of time uh, with the women folk as well. Uh, there's a picture on the lower part of the slide you know, it shows a gentleman cooking over a fire. So obviously growing up and being around uh, cooking all the time, Jacob uh, learned uh, to be a good cook. And uh, whilst uh, Esau, uh, he preferred to uh, go out uh, and about, and he indeed would become someone uh, who would actually uh, hunt. Now Genesis chapter 25 verse 27, it goes on to say that while Jacob was a quiet man, uh, he stayed among the tent. So it's very clear that he wasn't somebody who was actually heading out. Whereas Esau quite clearly says that he was a man of the open country, so he was going out all the time. And it actually said that he became a skillful hunter. Uh, the picture that's uh, below there is actually a uh, photograph that was taken in Israel when I was there. And this particular photo shows some ibex and they're actually climbing up this slope very rapidly. And if you look at them, you can see they're absolutely the same in color as the actual uh, rock itself. Now, this makes it very, very difficult uh, to actually see them. Now, these uh, animals, they were running so fast, in fact, that uh, this photo was taken with a telephoto lens, and we actually couldn't see them to the eye. We were literally pointing the camera in the direction, uh, and it captured these uh, ibex as they were moving up through this rocky slopes. Uh, so my point is, if you were a hunter, you would indeed have to be extremely skillful in order to catch uh, or to, uh, to shoot with an arrow uh, any of these in order to feed people. Uh, so indeed, I can understand when they said that Esau was a skillful hunter, that would, this would have been something uh, that was necessary. Uh, now, in this particular lesson, we're, going, we're, look, we're focusing on the journey uh, of Jacob and Esau. So at this point in time, 
Isaac uh, journey um, has changed because his father Abraham had died approximately when these two boys were 15 years of age. So at this point in time, uh, the Bible turns to focus on the next generation. Now, it makes clear that Jacob was a quiet-natured man. Not, not a solitary man, but a quiet-natured man because he was actually remaining behind the tents where all the people were. Uh, whereas his brother Esau, he would actually go out in solitude to hunt. So he was a more solitary man, a person who kept to himself more. Um, so there's a very distinct difference uh, between uh, the two of them. So as a consequence of this, you know, Jacob learned to cook. And there was an occasion where he had prepared and cooked a stew when his brother Esau returned from hunting in the open country. And of course, you can imagine if you've been out all day uh, in the wild working, uh, hunting, uh, for us today, playing sport perhaps, uh, you know, we work up a bit of an appetite and we're hungry. So you can just imagine coming home after uh, slogging it out all day and smelling this wonderful uh, food cooking. So the very first thing that was on Esau's mind was that he needed to eat something. So in Genesis chapter 25 verse 30, it says that Esau demanded of his brother, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. So uh, you can see there in the picture beside me, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, Esau uh, sitting on the rock, uh, eyeballing the stew whilst uh, Jacob is there, is there preparing this, uh, this food. Now, the thing is between these two brothers is they were quite different. And uh, when I opened, you could hear that prophetic word that was spoken over those two boys that, that would say that the older would actually, in fact, uh, and the younger would both have nations, but that one would actually uh, serve the other. Now, Jacob never lived in harmony with his brother, and his mother often told him how he and his brother jostled each other within her. So this is from Genesis chapter 5, verse 22. And this was occurring before they were born. So there was always this uh, picture painted for us uh, that they didn't get on even before they were born. Now Esau, he was the sort of guy who would live for the moment and for his own self-satisfaction, whereas Jacob was more contemplative. And uh, we can see that in the behavior. You know, when Esau arrives home, he's very impulsive and, and demanding. Um, so when this happened, you can see that Jacob must have been considering his future because in these days under the laws, what would happen is that the firstborn child would receive the inheritance from their father. And so this was a significant deal. Um, so for Jacob, uh, he would have been fully aware uh, that he wouldn't receive the inheritance, in fact, all the blessing of his father Isaac. So when Esau came in from hunting and he said, I'm famished, the first thing that Jacob replied to Esau, which you can read in Genesis chapter 25, verse 31, is he said, first, sell me your birthright. And of course, Esau, being impetuous, said, look, I am about to die. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So Esau swore an oath. And then Jacob gave him the bread and the lentil stew. He ate it, washed it down with drink, and then left. Literally, that simply, in that impetuous moment, Esau had sold his birthright. Perhaps you or I can identify with this. Perhaps there's been times in life when something at that particular point in time, we just impulsively say, I want it, and we don't care about the consequences. And this is certainly the case uh, for Esau. So in Genesis chapter 25, verse 34, it says, so Esau despised his birthright. So what does this mean? So the bargain that was made was Esau's by his birth, but Jacob's by promise. Jacob's desire for this birthright included the future possession of the very land of Canaan and the promise of the covenant that would lead to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So this is a huge deal. You know, this covenant promise that was given to Abraham was passed to Jacob's father, Isaac. And as a birthright, it would have gone to Esau. So when this uh, occasion happened, 
he basically despised his birthright. He didn't place any value on the significance that not only was he to receive something perhaps like material wealth, but in fact he was to inherit the very covenant of God and he tossed it away with a bowl of stew. So the covenant that led to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, of course, is the most significant thing. So Esau's greatest foolishness was to part with God for the pleasure of this world. That's literally what he did in this moment. But then you have to think about the alternate question because Jacob was very calculating. So will there be a consequence for Jacob's dishonesty? Now, sometime later, there was a famine that struck and it struck the land where they were living. Now at this point in time, they were living in Beer Lahoy Roy, which is the place right down in the very bottom corner of the map there. So it's on the way down to Egypt. It's basically on the very border of Israel with Egypt today. And this is the place where Hagar uh, had run to when the angel came and told her to return to Abraham. So this is a significant place. And this is the place where they had been living at this point in time. So when the famine struck, Jacob's father, he moved them to Gerar. And you can see that on the map a little bit further up uh, on the uh, towards the coast there. You can see Gaza on the left and Beersheba uh, across there on the right. So this is where he moved them to. And when he was there, it says that their wealth was multiplied. It says that the planted crops, so they were planting crops as well, reaped a hundredfold. So this can be found in Genesis chapter 26, verse 12. Flocks, herds, and servants also multiplied, but they were living in Philistine territory. And it says, but the Philistines became envious of them and filled wells dug in the time of Abraham with soil to stop their water supply. Now, obviously, water is absolutely critical. I'm just going to pop on this other slide, and this is a satellite map um, of, uh, in fact, Beersheba, the actual ancient tell with the ancient city there, and you can see the green writing that's in the middle. And when we have a look at this particular place, which we're going to come back to in a moment, um, the significant part about it is that there is actually rivers or streams, as they're known in Hebrew, called Nahal, and there's actually one on either side of this tell. So everywhere that they actually went in the land, there had to be a source of water. And of course, they had to have access to the water. Now, it says there was a famine. So this means that water wasn't abundant. It wasn't flowing in the river, but it does continue to be in the ground underneath. So they would have to sink wells there in order to retrieve this water. Now, when they were uh, living there, the king at the time was called King Abimelech and he told them to move away because there was causing conflict. So the Philistine people were envious because God's uh, chosen people were being blessed wherever they went. So he went to them and he told them that they must move away. So they packed up their tents and they went further out to the valley of Gerar. So that means that they went away from the coast and they went closer in fact uh, to where Beersheba was. But again, when they dug wells for water, the local herdsmen argued with them so much that his father Isaac took them from there to this place called Beersheba. So all the way through here from the coast, there's a series of rivers. Um, and they come uh, from the hill country and actually flow down to the actual coast. Uh, so there's these sources of water. So obviously everywhere that people chose to live in these days was dictated by provision they needed to have water to grow crops to live and to also to uh, have for their flocks and their herds so water was always significant so once again because of the conflict uh, the family were moved on again to Beersheba and when they arrived Jacob's father built an altar and called on the name of the Lord now when it says they called on the name of the Lord in the Old Testament uh, or the Hebrew Bible, uh, this actually means that they prayed. They simply talked with the Lord. And after praying, they pitched their tents and the servants dug a well. I'm just going to go back to this particular picture. 
So here we are at uh, Beersheba. Now this particular uh, picture that I've got on here for you, as I said, it, it is a satellite picture. And when I went to this place, Tel Beersheba, the original Beersheba, is actually uh, not the city of Beersheba as it is today. So Tel Beersheba is actually a little bit to the east of the main city, which is vast in size. So this ancient Tel, like most of the ancient cities, we often perhaps think that they're quite big, but they're in fact uh, quite small. Uh, but the significant thing here, once as I mentioned earlier, is that there's actually a river which passes around both sides of this Tel. So we know that there's a, a supply of water that's actually there. So uh, before I continue any further uh, on explaining this journey, I'm going to put on for you a few pictures um, and that's going to be followed by a video. Now the pictures actually show uh, the well which is actually uh, there at the entrance to this ancient city of Beersheba. Now that well is still there to this day and uh, you can actually go there. Um, so this confirms what the Bible actually tells us that uh, both Isaac and before him Abraham in fact used this well which is right next to uh, the river uh, or stream which is actually known as, uh, as the Beersheba River. Um, after you watch these uh, few pictures uh, it'll actually be followed by a short video and the short video is actually uh, taken from a position where I'm standing on top of this ancient tell and uh, from there uh, you can actually see the bed of the river which is actually all dry and uh, there's actually some Bedouin uh, herdsmen there who are herding goats and sheep just the same as uh, Isaac uh, would have done in the actual day so that you can actually get a feel for what the land is like. Now just remember and you can see the picture beside me how brown it is is that this is at the top of the Negev. So this is a very arid uh, desert region. Uh, so water was absolutely uh, vital. Uh, so once again, I'll just pop on this, uh, uh, these pictures and this video uh, for you to enjoy, and then I will uh, continue on uh, once you've watched that. here at Beersheba we've got some dogs barking at us and in front you can see the Bedouins through to this day they're moving all of their livestock so you can see the sheep there and there's a, a number of goats they're sort of predominantly to the back all coming through they've got the dogs there barking at us to protect the flock and the sheep's at the front the man at the front's just stopped and all the sheep have just stopped A pan over here to the left. You can see there's water all there in the creek in this barren land. But there's the water, and you can see behind us this is the, the Bedouin camp here. So it's just a great opportunity to see how the Bedouin people are living today. They're literally coming underneath all those other passes. be those same species of sheep and goats from the time of Abraham so looking down there you could be looking at a similar scene from that same old time well I hope you enjoyed that short video the purpose of showing you that is to to show you what the lamb was like and to show you the river course there that's right next to this uh, ancient tell or ancient city of Beersheba now I have videos that uh, show Beersheba itself as a city which I'll show in a later part of this series and the reason for that is that at this particular point in time and Isaac there of course there was no city. Uh, so we, we have to have a look at this and just understand uh, things in context in order to, to get the story. So we're in this uh, fairly barren land. Uh, we've got our herds and, and we've already mentioned how they've been growing crops. So water was absolutely 
uh, paramount. Uh, so they went across to uh, Beersheba and when they arrived, as I said, uh, Jacob's father built an altar and called on the name of the Lord. So he prayed to him and after praying, uh, the tents were pitched and the servants dug a well. Now, this particular uh, well was very significant because when they settled into their camp, King Abimelech came from Gerar and he also brought with him his personal advisor, Azazath, and the commander of his forces, Phicol. And they actually sought peace because obviously there'd been this conflict uh, and uh, Isaac had moved his family, which of course uh, comprised of Jacob and Esau, uh, and the servants and the and their mother Rebecca, and he had actually moved them uh, three times now because of the basically the threat to their lives. So, um, but they were wealthy people. Uh, he could see God's blessing on their life. So this was a bit of a concern for him, and so he would um, uh, have to make this. Uh, decision about how they were actually going to go forward. So there was also another incident that actually happened. And when they were in uh, Gerar, and when Isaac had agreed to stay there, there was an episode that occurred which was the same as what happened uh, with his grandfather Abraham. Because uh, his grandfather Abraham had lied to King Abimelech as well about Sarah being his sister rather than his wife and this repeats again. So we're talking about uh, the Philistine King Abimelech once again and you might think well hang on a second uh, wasn't he the same one that was there during the time of Abraham but uh, no that's not the case in fact uh, this is a different generation there's a long time has passed between the two um, and uh, so this is not the actual same uh, king. However, his name, uh, uh, of course, was the same. So Isaac told many of the men who inquired about his wife that she was his sister because he too thought, and from Genesis chapter 26 verse 7, it reads, The men of this place might kill me on account of Rebekah, because she is beautiful. So we see this repeat uh, circumstance and story, the same as Abraham had done when he went down to Egypt, and the same as Abraham had done again when he saw King Abimelech, the, uh, the previous one. Uh, so the same situation occurred. Uh, once again, uh, we have the same choices being made. But after a long time, King Abimelech saw that Isaac was caressing his wife and understood that she couldn't possibly be his sister. Uh, the fortunate thing that happened here was that he warned the people of Gerard not to molest either Isaac or Rebecca, otherwise they would be put to death. So like Abraham, Isaac demonstrated his sin nature when this happened, when he failed to trust in the Lord. So when they went into these circumstances, uh, doubt uh, crept into fear, and then uh, their trust completely failed in the Lord. So they lied, and as a consequence, uh, there was... Uh, uh, risks uh, that were taken and of course uh, the kings themselves were involved uh, in the outcomes but once again we see that God protects Isaac and he was blessed with great wealth so once again God's covenant uh, with them no matter what happened uh, he was going to make sure uh, that they were okay so once again uh, that's stepping uh, back a bit when they were in Gerar but this is one of those significant events that happened uh, which made them um, make this decision decision to move. So, you know, they had the, um, the Philistines, the general population, uh, were envious of them in Gerar. And then we also had this circumstance where Isaac had lied about his wife, Rebecca. So there was a couple of issues there, and that's what caused them to move on. Uh, once again, when they did move on, uh, and they moved to the Valley of Gerar, and dug the waters, uh, the wells for the water. The local uh, herdsmen argued with them and uh, they decided to move on again. So we can see here that Isaac is not seeking conflict uh, with the people there, uh, but certainly the conflict uh, was available. So because of this, uh, we come to this time where once they'd reached Beersheba, uh, at this particular point in time as well, uh, it's important to note that it wasn't actually. Uh, uh, um, 
a place which was of any significance. It was a place which was uh, a grazing land. Uh, those film footage that I showed you, you can see uh, that it's pretty barren. So there was nothing too impressive there. However, Isaac uh, did have a uh, the blessing of the Lord on him. He was wealthy. And so, of course, this was a problem for the Philistine king. So once again, uh, he came with his personal advisor and his commander and they sought peace. So they shared dinner together. And the next morning, Jacob witnessed his father swearing an oath with Kim Abimelech. And there they were left uh, to live in peace there. Now, just remember here that the name Beersheba actually means the well of the oath. So this is the second time now uh, that this well had come into play, the first time with uh, Abraham, but this time uh, we see the significance uh, of the oath itself and the purpose of the meaning behind the actual name. Now, uh, in 1795 BC, by my estimate, Esau would have been 40 years old. But instead of marrying from amongst his own people, he chose to marry uh, Judith, who was the daughter of a lady called Beery, uh, who was a Hittite, excuse me, of the gentleman called Beery, who was a Hittite. And he also married Basimath, who was a daughter of Elon, and he again was a Hittite. So Isaac was very unhappy about this, and you might think, well, why is it so significant? The problem was, is that Isaac would have been looking at Esau as the person who would inherit uh, the covenant of God. And so he here he was uh, marrying people who actually would worship false gods and would uh, draw him away uh, from their heavenly father. So this was a, a big problem. So as time went by, uh, Isaac grew old and he became blind. Uh, at this point in time, Jacob remained unmarried. So one day he sent for Esau and he said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then get your weapons, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my final blessing before I die. That reading comes from Genesis chapter 27 verses 2 to 4. This sows into this idea that uh, not only did Isaac like wild game uh, for a source of food, uh, but he loved Esau. And it was to Esau that he actually uh, gave the commandment. And it's quite clear here at the end that he said once he brought the tasty food to eat, that he would give his final blessing to Esau. So fulfilling Isaac's desire for a meal of his choosing was proof of Esau's love and affection for his father. It also confirmed that Isaac planned to give his final blessing to Esau, who was his firstborn son. But God had told Rebekah that Jacob, the secondborn, would inherit his covenant, and yet Isaac was intent on giving this to Esau. So didn't Rebekah tell him what God had said? Remember, God had told him, told her uh, what had actually happened between the two boys when they were in the womb with the struggle. And Esau had sold his birthright to Jacob, so was Isaac unaware of this as well? You know, so whether he was ignorant of these events or chose not to acknowledge them, his natural affection for Esau was still his priority. So on this same day, Jacob's mother, Rebekah, she'd listened to what Isaac had said to Esau and when he left to hunt, she set out to deceive her husband so that Jacob would receive the final blessing. Jacob was called by his mother Rebekah. And this is a reading from Genesis chapter 27, verse 6 to 10. And it says, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat, so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats, so I can prepare tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. 
then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. But Jacob was not comfortable with this. So he said to his mother, but my brother Esau is a hairy man and I'm a man with smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. His mother said to him, my son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say, go and get them for me. That second part of the reading comes from verses 11 to 13. So Jacob went out and he chose two young goats. His mother prepared for them a tasty meal. Then she dressed Jacob in Esau's clothes and covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with the goat skin so that Isaac would believe he was Esau. So we can get the impression from this that Esau must have been incredibly uh, hairy as a man. So Jacob received the tasty food and bread from his mother Rebekah and went to his father. He said, My father, to which Isaac answered, Who is it? Jacob entered into the lie then, and he responded, I am Esau, your firstborn. So if we ask the question, would this be the case if God had not told Rebekah? I mean, she knew beforehand the outcome that God had actually given her. So, you know, we have to think about this and think, well, you know, often the Lord gives us a prophetic word. He tells us what's going to happen, but then unfortunately we take the matters into our own hands and go about doing it our own way. So relying on the promise of God's word, Rebecca set out by any means to ensure it came to pass. We already know that she preferred her son Jacob. So when Jacob expressed his concern, so confident was she of the outcome that she thought nothing of receiving a curse. So from the beginning of time, when God created the first man, Adam, and the only law given was, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this was not obeyed and sin, the curse of mankind, entered the world. As the history of mankind unfolds, God's laws continue to be broken. His blessings were taken for granted, and even when fulfilling the law, righteousness fails. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. You see, it matters how we fulfill the law. And in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, it says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and of the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is why Jesus came. He came to bear the curse of the law, for even whilst abiding by the law, God's people sinned. So often, in the pursuit of a divine promise, we can find ourselves taking the wrong path. But we have to ask ourselves, does the end justify the means? When we walk in faith, we must be obedient to God and trust in his way, not our way. This is one of the many lessons revealed in this journey to faith. For whatever way or law God Almighty put in place to help us steer a righteous path through life, he still gave us a free will choice to do it our own way. Unfortunately, we often choose the wrong path. So three times Isaac asked Jacob, who he was. And three times Jacob lied to his father. After eating, Isaac smelt the clothes of Esau. Convinced, he gave the blessing intended for Esau to Jacob. And in Genesis chapter 27 verses 27 to 29 it says, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you of heaven's dew and of earth's richness, and abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. After this took place, Jacob left. Esau then returned and went to feed his father for his blessing, only to find that Jacob had been there already and deceived him, Isaac, that is, into giving his final blessing. Isaac was furious, and Esau hated Jacob. Esau asked to be blessed also, but Isaac said, so what can I possibly do for you, my son? The problem is, is that once the blessing's given, it can't be given again. There is only one blessing. 
So realising his father didn't have much time to live, he saw no option and planned to kill Jacob to receive Isaac's blessing. Rebekah heard of his plan and sought to send Jacob away to stay with his brother Laban until Esau cooled down. To prompt Isaac to make this happen, Rebekah said, I'm disgusted with living because of these Hittite women. If Jacob takes a wife from among the women of this land, from Hittite women like these, my life will not be worth living. That reads from Genesis chapter 27 verse 46. And because Esau had previously married two Hittite women who were a source of grief for Isaac and Rebekah, Isaac called for Jacob. So from Jacob's point of view, he received this call from his father. So he went to see him and he was commanded not to marry a Canaanite woman. So Rebekah's plan had worked. Jacob was told to go to Paddan Aram, which is in northern Mesopotamia, to the home where his mother had come from and seek to marry one of her brother Laban's daughters. He then blessed Jacob with God's everlasting covenant. And he said, May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. May he give you and your descendants the blessing given to Abraham so that you may take possession of the land where you now live as an alien, the land God gave to Abraham. So here we speak the Abrahamic covenant over Jacob's life. It talks about him multiplying, increasing numbers into a community of peoples. So this is a very extremely significant moment. This is the point in time where it becomes abundantly clear that, I, that Isaac has blessed his second son Jacob rather than his first son Esau with the covenant of Abraham. Esau heard what happened and he understood the nature of his father's command to Jacob not to marry a Canaanite woman. But in defiant retaliation he then married Mahalath who was actually the daughter of Ishmael. Ishmael if you remember was actually the firstborn son of uh, Abraham. So being out of favour with no blessing, it appears he set out to antagonise Isaac. So he'd already married two Hittite women, now he married the daughter of Ishmael. So if we reflect on Rebekah's pregnancy before Jacob and Esau were born, God told Rebekah that two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. He had already come, chosen which child would receive the blessing of his covenant. Esau's behaviour reflected this outcome when he equated the value of his inheritance to a bowl of stew. Hungry, he had said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. Jacob replied, First sell me your birthright. So Esau foolishly responds, look, I'm about to die. What good is the birthright to me? But when Isaac was soon to die and Jacob received his blessing, Esau tried to prevent this from being fulfilled by taking his life. There will be times in our lives that we can't change God's will, but we must not do evil in the hope that good will come. This is one of the lessons that we receive from this situation that occurred between Jacob and Esau. So if we ask the question, how can a blessing obtained unfairly through the manipulation of Rebekah and the lies of Jacob go unpunished by God? It seems unreasonable, doesn't it? So although many sins were committed, God overruled them to fulfill his purpose. But there will be consequences for their actions, for God sits in judgment of them all. So in our next lesson, we're going to follow this journey and we're going to see what happens. So that brings me to the end of this lesson about Jacob and Esau and the selling off of the birthright and the deception that arrived in the blessing that Jacob received. This is an extraordinary story and it's very significant in the journey 
because from Jacob will come the nation of Israel. So I thank you for joining me in this lesson. Um, this is a part of a Journey to Faith series. Uh, you've been watching uh, this particular lesson. Uh, if you haven't seen any of the lessons before, this is lesson nine. Uh, so you can uh, have a look on my YouTube channel. Uh, if you have a look at the playlist, a Journey to Faith, and you will see all of the other lessons there for you to view and to enjoy. Uh, this uh, series does follow the genealogy of Jesus, which can be found in the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. Uh, we are following the life and times of each and every descendant from the time of Abraham until the time of our Lord Jesus Christ.